million 360 videos uploaded to Facebook, YouTube, and other social media sites in 2016 and is expected to be an $11.5 billion industry by 2025. Delivering a fully immersive spherical view of a scene, 360 videos enable the viewer to watch video in virtual reality from any direction, transforming the experience. 360 videos are recorded using anywhere from 2 to 24 individual cameras aimed in different directions and recording simultaneously to capture an omnidirectional view. The more cameras used, the higher resolution, therefore the higher quality the final 360 degree experience ends up. A major challenge with creating 360 video involves combining or stitching the output of these multiple camera views into a single seamless video image to create an immersive sense of visual realism. The more cameras used, the more stitching is required. Combining video output from professional grade 360 degree camera rigs using up to 24 cameras can require hours of post-processing and substantial compute resources. Radeon Loom revolutionizes the 360-degree video stitching process, overcoming the formidable technology challenges through massively parallel GPU processing to achieve both real-time live stitching and faster offline stitching of 360 videos. Using AMD's open source implementation of the Kronos OpenVX computer vision framework, Radeon Loom's GPU processing is capable of stitching input from up to 24 cameras to 4K times 2K stitched output in real time, and from up to 31 cameras to 8K times 4K offline, including virtual camera overlays, underlays, and watermarking. Radeon Loom delivers the power of professional grade video post processing, enabling today's new breed of 360 video filmmakers to create the amazing cinematic VR experiences of tomorrow. For more information, visit www.gpuopen.com. That's what happens when your marketing department decides to put together a video. I actually got this just a few hours ago to prove it, so. <laughs> Sorry that it was a little bit too uh, basic, right, for this audience, but they were trying to do a good thing. Okay, so I'm going to talk about what we did and why and why we did this whole Project Loom, and we have a demo over here that you can see later that's really cool. Uh, so the idea of stitching video to make 360 video started a long time ago. People wanted to do panoramas and things, and back then it was sort of like traveling down a dirt road. You were just glad that you could get there. Right? I mean, there's, it's really a really difficult thing, and just the fact that someone was able to do that was almost like a heroic thing. And then someone came along, or you know, several people worked, and they, they sort of like paved the road. Right? And we took a look at this, and I'll explain more about why in a, in a little bit. But we said, oh, this needs to be much faster. So we built, basically, the stitching superhighway for everyone to use. And it's, it's sort of like it's a, it's a freeway. It's open source. Anyone can get on it and use it. Anyone can put their own vehicles on it. And that's what I'm going to talk about. So let's just look at the, the boring text features for a minute here. It's open source. It's highly optimized for GPU. We can stitch 4K by 8K, 4, 8K by 4K output on our graphics chips that'll come out in a few months. Right now we can do 4K, which is all anyone can actually play. We can also stitch to 6K. Uh, the demo that you're gonna see over here is 4K output because that's all that we can send to those headsets. We can stitch up to 31 cameras. Developers can add or replace components from it. We can add in virtual cameras. You'll see in our demo we added in like uh, augmented reality uh, features. And you can do it for real time or you can use it for offline. There's all sorts of ways that you can actually use this. So how did we actually get here? 
So we started about a year ago, and we were posed with the problem of building a cinematic camera and stitching it in real time so the director of the movie could watch what was in the camera. And we got together and we said, well, we could probably put together a whole bunch of servers and GPUs and probably do this. And we started working on it, and in the end, we were able to do it with one PC, one graphics chip. So this, this is a real camera. We're not going in the camera business. This is a research camera, but it was made for a specific movie. So here it is in action on the set of Bahubali 2 uh, movie. You can see this is, this is a really large set. There's all these uh, blue screens that they're going to composite in in post-production, lots of things. And I'm going to take... Uh, second here to switch out of this. Okay, so what exactly is loom? Right, so loom is this part in the middle, this loom stitching. And then we're, we're trying to build out this whole ecosystem around it of other partners that have different components that feed into this so that you can do everything from the Ricoh Theta like this camera, all the way to the big cinematic cameras. So on the far left, you can see we can take inputs from files or from cameras. We can decode from using FFmpeg from various uh, codec sources. We can also take direct input from cameras, so HDMI, SDI, and that's what you'll see in this demo over here. We then stitch on the GPU, and then we can output it in any various number of ways. So we're working with partners such as Vizbit, who happens to be right here. And they're doing some of this on the right-hand side where we've got the cloud side and the VR player and the, the streaming. So we're gonna be able to stitch at a higher resolution from higher quality cameras, upload it to the cloud at higher resolution, and then with a technology like Vizbit, they can actually take that higher resolution and just deliver down to the headset, the smaller portion that the user's actually viewing at that time by doing real-time head position uh, location, uh, corrections. We have other partners, for example, Advantech, who we're working with on this hardware encode external. They have an 8K encoder card that'll enable all this. So you'll be able to stitch at that higher quality and stream live to the internet. Today we can stream live to the internet to, for example, YouTube, uh, it's 4K or less or even 1080p. And then alternatively you can not stream live and you can do post-production and you can do this all this same kind of flow and just output to files and use those files as your post-production uh, toolkit. So this is what the whole architecture looks like from the point of view of the whole software stack. So all those blue components are parts of the driver that already exist in our graphics cards. The green parts are the parts that are loom. The gray parts are things that an ISV would build. So one thing to look at there is the FFmpeg interface. So you can take some anything that you can decode or encode with FFmpeg, we can interface via our LUMIO model on, on the input side or the output side. This AMF SDK, that's our internal to the graphics chip media codec. So the graphics chips have built-in decoders and built-in encoders, and you can use those there. LUMIO is the interfaces to everything, like I showed in that previous diagram, how you get data into the graphics chip and how you get it out for stitching. Custom ISV kernel, so I'll talk about that in a minute, but essentially, as an ISV developer building an application that's doing stitching, you can look at the way that we did all the stitching algorithms and you can either like them or you can decide to improve on them. So you can throw out any of them that we've built and add in your own, but you don't have to build the entire framework or the entire pipeline in order to take advantage of some innovation that you've come up with. Independent software vendor. Loom Shell, so we built in a tool that allows you to write with the command line application 
a complete stitching pipeline, and I'll show you an example in just a minute. But essentially, this same tool acts as a QA tool, acts as a debugger, and acts as an application generator if you don't actually need a user interface, or as it acts as a prototyping tool. So you can prototype the entire thing using this Loom Shell interface. This, I, you're not supposed to be able to read this, but this is an entire stitching pipeline built with this Loom Shell. So this is the entire amount of code that you'd have to write to, use, to build a stitcher using our toolkit. Now obviously, if you're gonna actually write a new module, you're gonna have to write some you know, real C code or open seal code or something to actually interface, but you can put together the entire stitcher with this for your particular camera. So if you're a camera maker and you want a really quick and dirty stitcher, you can do it with that code. This code's relatively simple. What it's doing is it's initializing some buffers, initializing the context for a few things, and then it's describing all the parameters of your cameras and lenses, and then it just tells it to stitch a frame, and then it closes down. So this is what a stitching pipeline looks like. This is the one for offline stitching where we take input from files, we decode, we color space convert, we correct for the lenses, we warp the output into the echo rectangular format, we adjust exposure, do seam finding, do some blending, and then we scale it and we're done. The pipeline looks almost the same as a pipeline that you would use for real time. So in real time, the difference is you're capturing the data directly from the cameras and feeding it into the same pipeline. And then at the end, you're outputting it to one of several different choices. So we'll show you an example of that in just a minute. All of these different modules have lots of different parameters. So I'm just showing, for example, for the seam finding, there's a lot of parameters that you might need to use. But like I said, if you don't like the seam find that we built, you can throw it out and insert your own. Right, the pipeline's very flexible. So this is what the whole pipeline looks like in this demo, where we have multiple cameras, I'm just showing three here. They all get fed into the GPU, they get stitched. There's a SDI interface between two PCs where it sends it to another PC where there's a headset. And this is an alternative way you could configure the same thing. Instead of having a viewing PC, you could have a PC that's streaming to the cloud. And because of the flexibility of the SDI interface, uh, you can actually connect multiple PCs to the same SDI stream, and so you can have many PCs all doing different things like displaying or streaming or streaming at different resolutions. But if you don't know what SDI is, it's a serial digital interface. It's a, it's an interface used in a lot of professional uh, studio equipment. It's not really expensive, but it's not cheap either. Like one SDI capture card from a company like Blackmagic probably cost uh, $300 or something. So it's more expensive than something like USB, but uh, it's used in a lot of broadcast kind of equipment. So one final thing here before we get to questions is what does the blending step look like? So, if you were to just do the simplest thing and you take two images, and this is like in a panorama that you take with a camera, you have, but they're both at different exposure levels. So you can see the picture on the right is very dark, the picture on the, on the, picture on the left is very dark, picture on the right is very light. If you just blend them together, or you, well, you don't blend them, you just stick them together, you're gonna get something that looks, and you balance the, the exposures, you're gonna get something like this where you can see that line Right. The blending that we do, essentially, it doesn't really erase the line. What it does is it takes high frequency information, low frequency information in what's called a Laplacian pyramid, and then reconstructs the data afterwards. And so difference in exposure uh, over a wide range is low frequency information, and that information is blended over a wide number of pixels and all the detailed information, the high frequency information, is blended over a small region, and that's how your eye basically gets fooled by this and you actually just see no line. So that's it, any questions? No questions.
questions. How close to real time to be? Well, you're going to see the demo. So the demo is real time. So it depends on your definition of real time. So, for example, <laughs> there's a latency. Okay, so you can go over there and you can wave your hand and you can see your hand moving. Uh, it's it's about a half a second or less. Right. So that's really low. So if you're doing live streaming over the internet, you really don't care if it's a half a second or one second or five seconds. So network TV has a several second delay. So if you're watching the Super Bowl, right, it's not going to be happening on your TV set at exactly the same time it came from the cameras. There's several seconds delay that's going on. Okay. So we can, we can work in an environment that's equal to what broadcast TV is. Okay, now the question is what's the use case? So our primary initial use case was take a big cinematic camera and let the director and the crew and the, you know, the camera people see what's happening in a headset while it's happening. Because before this, for shooting 360 video, what did you do? Well, you turn on the camera and you record it to flash drives and then hours or days later you got to see what the output was. So we're able to actually see the output Real time. Right. Yeah. Other question? Uh, so the question is: Does your software need to know the, the like, the, like uh, the location of the camera rack? You know, different cameras and where they're pointing to. And if you have more cameras, the, does your software behave better in terms of where the stitching would the signal line? Okay. Did everyone get that? The question is: How do you calibrate your cameras and lenses? <laughs> And the answer is yes, we need to know that. So in some software that's out there that's commercial software, you can just throw it a pile of pictures and it'll figure it all out for you. So we're, we're not doing that step. We're doing the step after you've figured it all out. So we need to know that information. So you can get that from other existing applications that are out there, like PT GUI is the one that we use. So we actually, when we set this camera up, we actually ran PT GUI it did a calibration and we fine-tuned it and then we took those parameters and those parameters are input to our software. So that, that's why we're not like a commercial application, we're a toolkit for developers. We want people to take this as the high-speed part of the stitching and build all those other things around it that you need to actually make a complete solution. Someone else had a question here earlier? Okay, so the question is, are the cameras identical or some of them different than each other? So, in our rig over there, everything is identical. By the way, this rig that we're showing here is uh, Blackmagic cameras with custom lenses and the whole rig is built by a company called 360 Rise. So 360 Rise, you might know them, they used to be called 360 Heroes. They, they're, they're the biggest seller of the GoPro uh, camera rigs and they just announced this Blackmagic camera rig at NAB New York uh, about a month ago. So we're using identical lenses on this, but there's not a requirement to use identical lenses. Okay. Yeah, other questions? Yeah. Uh, yeah, how do you, are you guys dealing with uh, lens de-warping? Like the, how you, you know, profiles from different lenses? Louder. <clears throat> are you guys dealing with lens de-warping? Yes. Okay. Yeah, we do the lens dewarping. So one of the steps in there is actually the, what we call the lens correction. So it takes what looks, if you, if you know like a GoPro camera, they're very wide angle, you take pictures, they have this curvature to them. It sort of looks cool if you're surfing, but if you're trying to stitch a bunch of them together, you just ruined everything because they don't line up. So that's the very first step in the pipeline is actually correcting the lenses to get rid of that curvature, uh, the barrel distortion or the fisheye distortion and straightening it out, essentially. Other questions or we're about to end? Okay, one last slide. So everyone always says, has links that you can go and do things. So you can take a picture of that if you want to get the link. But if you just want to remember the Google search terms, I did all these searches and you can just search for Radeon Loom 
and you can search for Bahubali VR experience to get that uh, video about what's going on. Okay, and that's it. Carl, who's next? Thanks so much, Mike. All right, next up, we are going to have Caleb from 